Good morning church and welcome to another one of our Sunday messages. I hope that this message finds you on the end of a good week. Did you know that we celebrated Ascension this week, the day that marks the risen Christ returning to his Father's side in heaven, or as some people have called it, the day Jesus started working from home. Just a little lockdown joke there to get us started. This morning I would like us to continue looking at our series of God's people in confinement. You remember we looked at Joseph in prison, we looked at Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem who were in under siege, locked down. Today I want us to look at the people of Judah during the Babylonian captivity, a different type of confinement. These people weren't told to stay in their houses, they were taken away from their homes and they were put in other homes. They were taken over to Babylon and they were relocated and they were told to stay there. Quite a different situation from anything that we've probably ever experienced. But during this situation, the prophet Jeremiah writes to the elders with a message from the Lord, giving them instructions about how to deal with this new situation they found themselves in. And I just believe there are some lessons in this letter to the people of Judah that we can take away and apply to our own lives this morning. So if you have your Bibles, I'm going to be reading from Jeremiah chapter 29 and I'm going to start at verse 4. Jeremiah 29, 4. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to those that I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters and find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there and do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams that they've been having. They are prophesying lies to you in my name, and I have not sent them. Instead, this is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. This is the Lord's message to the men and women of Judah who suddenly found themselves in captivity. And there's just a few points in this letter that I want to just pull out and look at for our, our situation right now. The first part is, at the beginning of this letter, God says this, he says, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all of those that I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Right at the beginning of the letter, God is saying that this letter is from him. This message is from him. Although it's Jeremiah who's writing it, God is saying this is, this is my message to you. But look at how he describes the people of Judah. Look at how he describes the people that he is sending this message to. He describes them as those that I carried into exile. Right here at the very beginning of this letter of instructions, God is identifying himself as the one who took them into exile. Right at the very beginning, it's as if God is putting his hands up and saying, I'm the one. I'm the one that brought you to exile. I'm the one that led you to Babylon. I'm the one that brought you into this difficult situation that you're going through right now. Why does God say this to them? Why, why does he start off this way? It might not seem like the best way to start a letter to people who you're hoping are going to listen to you. Well, the reason he's saying it is because the, the people of Judah had some false prophets among them and the false prophets were saying things like, God is going to come and rescue us. He's going to deliver us from Babylon. He's going to take us home. And in about within two years' time, everything will be back to normal. 
we'll be home, we'll be safe, we'll have all our stuff back, we'll have our comforts back, it'll all be fine, give it two years, God will change our circumstances. And the reason that God is saying, I am the one who brought you into exile, is because God is wanting them to realise that the, the reason they are in this situation is because he wants them to be there right now. God God has led them to Babylon because he wants to use Babylon to shape them. The people of Judah are in a bit of a bad way and God is going to use the state of Babylon to fulfill his purposes in them. And the reason, so the reason he's saying this is he's like, look, don't sit around ignoring the circumstances, ignoring what's happening to you and saying, God will save us, God will deliver us, God's going to come and just make everything all right. God is saying to them here, no, 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 I brought you here. This stuff that's happening to you, I'm not going to deliver you from this quickly. I'm not going to remove this difficult situation from you. I've brought you into a difficult situation because I want to use it to shape you. That's what God's saying to them. And you know what? Yes, God did eventually deliver them from Babylon, but not until 70 years of pruning had taken place in their lives. And I think this is just something that is worth us remembering, that God is a God who will often use the difficult situations that we are facing. How much time have we spent in prayer asking God, to change our situation? How much energy have we spent hoping that God will remove all the difficult stuff in our lives when actually God is using those challenges, God is using those difficult circumstances to fulfil his purposes in us? And we are praying that God removes the very thing that he's using to make us who he wants us to be. Perhaps God doesn't want things to go back to normal for you and me quite so quickly. Perhaps God doesn't want to remove the challenges and the difficulties that we are currently facing in our lives. I don't know what you're going through right now personally. I don't know what you have been praying that God will take away. But perhaps we need to open our mind to the possibility that God is wanting to use that for us and perhaps our prayer shouldn't be God remove this situation from me perhaps our prayer should be God use this situation to change me the second thing that I want to pull out of this is in verse 5 God says to the people of Judah who are now in Babylon build houses Settle down, plant gardens and eat the things that you grow in the gardens. Have sons and have daughters. Get your sons and daughters married so that they can have sons and daughters. In other words, God is saying to them, get on with your lives. You're in Babylon now. There's not going to be a quick fix. You're not going to be going home tomorrow. Get on with your lives. Look at the long term plans that God is telling them to do here. Build houses, have kids, grandkids. These are, these are long-term things. God is telling them to settle down where they are and get on with things. He's saying, I know you've had an upset. I know that everything's changed and everything's different. I know that you just want things to go back to normal right now, but there's not going to be a miracle fix. There's not going to be a quick overnight cure to all of this stuff so don't sit around with your life on pause get on with your life build houses where you are have kids where you are let them have kids and find husbands and wives where they are just because our circumstances have changed dramatically and our circumstances continue to change in the days ahead that doesn't mean that life does not go on that doesn't mean that life is on pause and the reason I'm saying this is because 
in a short amount of time. I've heard quite a few people saying things along the lines of, well, this year is just ruined. This year's just, nothing's happening this year. 2020 is a write-off. I've heard people saying that I can't wait till next year when things can get back to normal, when we can start getting on with things again. And, and it seems like there's a bit of a mindset among some people that, that because of social distancing, because of reduced movements and lockdown, that somehow life is kind of on pause. Life is kind of just not happening at the minute and we have to wait for this circumstance to blow over before things can get back to normal. And But, but God is saying to the people of Judah, look, you're in this situation. Don't hang about and wait for the situation to change. Get on with your life. Get on and be the people that I'm calling you to be. Get on and do the things that you're supposed to be doing. And can I just encourage you, you know, let us not just think that our life is on pause. Let us not just spend the next few months or whatever sitting, sitting around on our hands, glued to the TV like a bunch of zombies, just waiting for some future day when things will go back to normal when things will just all start up again. Get on with your life now. Your life is happening right now. You know, why don't you just spend your time, phone the people you love, reconnect with some old friends, find a hobby, start a project, read some books you've always wanted to read, write a book that you've always thought you might want to write. Uh, one of my friends I saw on Facebook the other day learned to juggle with clubs during lockdown he used that time to try something different personally juggling is not really my cup of tea but you know why not why not use this time to do something different you only get to live each day once there's no second chances for today this is the day that the lord has made so let us rejoice and be glad in it and live it to the best of our ability despite the circumstances. Amen. The next instruction that we see God give the people is this. Verse 7. He says to them, Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you will prosper too. Can you believe this? Can you believe that God is telling the people of Judah to pray for Babylon? Let's remember that, that Babylon is the enemy nation who just marched to Judah, tore down the gates of Jerusalem, took them all away, took all their gold, put a lot of people to the sword, and have just carted them off across the desert, taken them prisoner and just said, you live here now. You're part of our country now. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine something that terrible happening? And here, what is God saying to them? He's saying, he's saying, pray for them. Work for the peace and the prosperity of them, of your captors. God isn't telling them to fight. God isn't telling them to rebel. He isn't telling them to resist. He's telling them to pray that their enemies receive peace peace and prosperity he's telling them to invest into the enemy state of Babylon why why is God telling his people to do this because verse 7 if Babylon prospers then you too will prosper if the city they're in is at peace, then their lives will also have peace. If the city they're in prospers, then they will share in that prosperity. The message here is very clear that what is good for the many, in this case, is also good for the few. It is also good for the individual. And this is really important because how often do we not think like that? How often do we think, well, we just take care of myself. Look after number one. Look after me and my own family. Don't really need to worry about anyone else's family. Just look after 
me, myself and I and, and let the rest of the place, let the rest of the town, the rest of the country, the rest of the nation just, just kind of take care of itself as long as I'm all right. How long, how often is our attitude often like that? God, God bless me. God prosper me. God give me peace. But here, God is saying that by looking after the society that you're a part of, you are in fact also taking care of yourself. By looking after the welfare of the society that you're in, you are in fact looking after your own welfare. And this is something that we need to think about more than ever, isn't it? More than ever, we need to realise that that we're all in this together. You know, there, there is no getting through a, pande a pandemic if, if you're only looking after number one. Because, because the only way that we get through this as individuals, the only way that we, we come out the other end of this as individuals is when our country comes out the other end of it. You know, there's no just looking after ourselves in this situation because you can look after yourself and be all right. But if everything else, if there's problems out in the wider society, then nothing will move forward. But if the wider society finds peace, finds health, finds healing, finds prosperity, moves forward, then we as individuals, we as our own families, move forward with it. Working towards a common good really is the best way to look after yourself. Seek the peace and the prosperity of the city which I have brought you to because if it prospers, you will prosper too. Amen. Let me just finish this by looking at the last verse of our reading. And let me ask, why did God tell the people of Judah to do these things? Why did he tell them to get on with their lives despite the circumstances? Why did he tell them that there wasn't going to be a quick fix, rather there was going to be a 70 year wait before things turn around? Why did he tell them to invest into Babylon to pray for the peace and the prosperity of the enemy state that was holding them captives? Why did God do all of this? Because, verse 11, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Why does God allow us to endure difficult situations? Why does God not run in and deliver us and save us and pull us out of trouble every time we find ourselves in it? Because he has a plan and a purpose for our lives in the long term. He has a vision of who we could be and who he wants us to be and what he is doing in you right now is bigger and better than what you want him to do for you. You know, you might want God to just run in and miraculously change your situation. But the greatest miracle that God is going to do is make a change in you. Amen. Father, I just pray for my church family, God, and everyone who's listening to this, whatever situation they're going through, whatever Babylon experience they have found themselves in, Lord, I pray that you help them just thrive in it, live their lives to the max, despite their circumstances. God, give them the strength and the vision to prosper the society around them so that they too, God, can rise up in it. And Lord, we remind them that you have a plan and a purpose for them and that all the difficulty and all the hardship, God, that might be going through their lives right now like a storm, actually you are using that to shape them, to grow them and to turn them into the best possible version of themselves for the glory of Jesus Christ. In his name, Amen. Amen. Bless you, church. God, God bless. And I hope to see you soon. Bye.